21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. It's sinking. Well, what is it, a freighter? Oh, a barge. A collision with what? Yeah. Yeah. I see. You're in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Hello, CB. Sergeant Ward is at the 21st. There's a gravel barge sinking in the East River off 61st Street. No, they got the barge captain off all right. You better send a police launch and ESD, okay? Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour. At 8.35 a.m., sector car number five came by the house to take me to the East River Drive near 61st Street. A gravel barge had sunk in the river on the previous day, and salvage operations to clear the channel had begun that morning. I had anticipated that the work would create a curious attraction and result in a serious traffic problem along the East River Drive. As Patrolman Dillon, the operator of sector car number five, drove me to inspect this condition, I saw in the block ahead of us a large moving van parked at the curb in front of 181 Sutton Place North, one of a row of large and elegant residences which had in recent years been converted into multiple dwellings of medium-sized, very expensive apartments. Also parked there were two departmental vehicles, sector car number two and the sergeant's car. I instructed Patrolman Dillon to pull into the curb. And as he did, I could see Sergeant Waters standing on the sidewalk talking to an attractive and well-dressed woman. Four moving men were several feet away engaged in conversation near the cab of their van. All right, stay with the car, Dylan. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. Well, I don't see why I can't. Oh, what's the trouble here, Sergeant? Mrs. Lenwick, this is Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the 21st Precinct. How do you do? Mrs. Lenwick, well, what is it, Sergeant? I just want my furniture, that's all. That's what I had these men come for, to get my furniture. They're standing around, and I have to pay them while they stand around. It is by the hour, you know. Well, why can't she get her furniture? That's exactly what I'd like to know. Well, Captain, seems like the super won't let her up in the building. He won't let her into the apartment. Oh, why not? It's mine. I'm entitled to get into it. Super says she separated from her husband about three weeks ago. He says he's still living in the building. Super said he's got no right to let her go in there without permission from the husband. Look, I have the key. You see, I have the key. The furniture always belongs to the wife. The things in the house always belong to the wife. That's taken for granted. Not necessarily. Well, in this case, they do. Now, something ought to be done, because I can't keep these men standing around and paying them an hourly rate. Uh, where is the super, Sergeant? He's inside with Vaccaro, Captain. The super's been trying to reach the real estate company that manages these buildings. Mm, well, I don't know who he has to talk to. Well, you've got to remember, Mrs. Linwick, that if they let you go in, they could be liable. I can't imagine what they'd be liable for. I'd just be getting my own things. Why didn't you take them when you left? Because I left at 2.30 in the morning. How could I take them then? Well, you could have come back for them within a reasonable time. Now, look, one doesn't find an apartment the first day they go looking. I moved into a hotel and sent for my clothes. Now, I have found an apartment, and I want my furniture. Where is Mr. Linwick? I haven't any idea. Super told me he saw him leave the house with a suitcase last night. He was apparently going out of town on business, Captain. He's always going out of town. Super's been trying to call Mr. Linwick's office as well as the real estate company. I don't suppose either of them opens until 9 oh. o'clock. All this to do about something that belongs to me. Have you talked this over with your husband, Miss Linwick? I have not. Well, don't you think you ought to? I see no reason to. It'd be a lot simpler if you worked it out together, if you decided what's yours and what's his. I know what's mine, and I know what's his. Very little is his. Well, I can't say that the best way to do it is to come around here when he's out of town and go into the apartment. I think the least you could do would be to notify him what you're up to. There's no reason for that. I spoke to my lawyer, and I am perfectly within my rights. Perfectly within my rights. Well, that may be your lawyer's opinion, but what about your husband's lawyer? I don't give two hoots for his lawyer's opinion. Now, look, I have a business of my own to attend to. I'm a fashion designer, and pe people start to call me at 9.30 in the morning, and, and they want me. They want to talk to me. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. 
Have you got Mrs. Linwick's new apartment address? Vaccaro's got it, sir. 622 East 52nd Street. Uh -huh. well, have you got her office address? Yes, sir. Vaccaro's got that, too. Well, it's certainly beyond me what it takes to get my own furniture back. To have that stubborn man say no, not to let me up in the building, and to have to have the police involved in this thing. Well, it'll all be settled, Miss Linwick. Oh, yes, I'm sure it will be. In the meantime, you know how much it's costing me an hour with those four men in that truck standing by there? It's costing me plenty. There's one consolation, ma'am. It's probably causing your husband a lot more. I don't care what it costs him. Oh, uh, here's a super, Captain. Oh, yes. Uh, Mr. Swanagi. Yeah. I'm right here. That's not necessary, I tell you. I'm entitled to take my own things out. You may think you're entitled to, Mrs. Limwick. Your lawyer may think you're entitled to. I may think you're entitled to. But you don't take nothing out of there until I get the word from the office. Now, I'm not getting caught in the middle of any deal like this. Believe me. This is Captain Kennelly. Oh, yeah. Joe Swanagi, uh, the super here. How do you do? I heard a lot about you, Captain. These pleasantries aren't getting us any place. Sometimes pleasantries can get you pretty far, Miss Linwick. You said it, Captain. She comes around here 8 o'clock in the morning with the moving men. It gives me a hard time. What am I supposed Look, to... these are my Mrs. things. Mrs. Linwick, I told you, I don't care whose things these are. That doesn't make a bit of difference to me. What do you mean? They can be yours. They can be President Eisenhower's. Nothing goes out of here until I get the okay from the oh, office. Oh, of all the stupidity, I can never in my life... Call it stupid. Anything you want. That doesn't make any difference to me. If they tell me to let you in there, you're perfectly welcome. Now, Captain, you can understand how I don't want to get caught in the middle here. Yes, I can understand. Hey, you see, Mrs. Limwick, now, if he can understand, why can't you? My lawyer told me I could go in there any time and take anything oh, out. Oh, look, Mrs. Limwick, look, that, that's what makes horse races. Your lawyer may have one opinion, somebody else's lawyer may have another opinion. That's what keeps the Supreme Court in business. Uh, Mr. Swanagi, where did you use the phone? Oh, uh, down in my apartment, down there in the basement. Uh, and you tried both the real estate company and Mr. Linwick's office? Yes, sir, I tried them both. I don't get any answer any place. It's too early. Well, I think you might try again. I'll try if you want me. I'll go downstairs with you, if you don't mind. Yes, I wish you would, Captain. I wish you would see to it that he does try. I don't want to keep these men in this truck waiting any longer than I have. You don't believe that I try? All right, she believes you. Sergeant, you stay here with Miss Linwick. Yes, sir. Let's go try the phone again. Yeah. And just make sure that he does try, Captain. Yes, I will. <laughs> she thinks her husband slipped me ten bucks not to let her in. Evil mind, you know. I'll, I'll get the gate here. Thank you. He does take care of me once in a while, yeah, for small favors. You know. But I swear, Captain, he never mentioned a word about letting her into the apartment to get any furniture. With uh, downstairs. She uh, left him three weeks ago, is that right? Yeah, that's what the talk is. She just walked out one night after a hot argument. About three weeks ago, I guess. Uh, we're in here. It's all right, Ellie. All right, just me to use the phone again. My wife. <laughs> She worries when she hears that door open. Uh, uh, how long have they been living here? Oh, let's see, uh, five, six years, I think. Yeah, about five years. Now, this has happened before, you know. Uh -huh. She gets up, she leaves him about three or four times a year. You know, I told my Ellie they ought to put a, a swinging door up there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, this, this three weeks is a long time. She never walked out for more than a couple of days at a time before. You know. Oh, didn't she? No, no. Sometimes it was uh, two or three days, sometimes three or four days, sometimes a week. But she always comes back. What does he do? Mr. Limwick? Yeah. Well, he's, uh, he's an engineer, like. You know, he, he goes around companies in trouble, you know, with something the matter with their plant or the way things are working or they need uh, more space or something. He goes around, like, he makes what they call these uh, surveys. You know, it's very technical stuff. Mm -hmm. I bet he had to go to some school, learn all that. Huh? Where's his office? Oh, down in Wall Street. Got a place down in Wall Street. Got a firm named uh, Engineers with his name, and there's three or four others in it. You know, like uh, like a bunch of lawyers, only just a bunch of engineers. Yeah. His name's right up there, too. Uh, first, I think. Linwick something, something, and something. There's uh, no financial problem, is there? Well, listen, as far as I know, none. They pay the rent on time, on the button, or he does. And to pay the rent in this place on time, that means no financial problems. You know what they get for three rooms here? You wouldn't believe it. Yeah. Should, should I call? Yeah, try his office again first. All right, sir. Uh, after she moved out, Mr. Linwick didn't ask you to change the lock or anything, did he? No, sir. He, he didn't mention anything like that. He, he didn't say a word. I didn't mention it. As far as I was concerned, she was coming back. <laughs> she always does. 
Well, it's ringing. There's nobody down there yet, I don't think. Well, let it ring a little more. Yeah. I don't know. As far as I'm concerned, if I was him, first time she walked out, I'd have had that lock changed. Even my alley, who always takes the lady's side in these things, didn't like her. You know, they're not going to answer there. Nobody, nobody's there yet. All right. You know, if that lady wants to do the right thing, she'd get together with him, she'd get it all worked out. They'd say, this is mine, this is yours. They'd separate all the stuff, you know, and things like that. Not to come around there with a moving truck, 8 o'clock in the morning, want to clean the joint, huh? Yeah, you better try the real estate office. Uh, yeah. Fine way to do to a guy. Come around, just clean him out. What time they usually open up, 9? Yeah, 9, but uh, sometimes somebody's there before. I don't see the logic in it. I don't understand. Hello. Oh, hello. This is Joe Swanagi, the Super 181 Sutton Place North. Is Mr. Solent in this morning yet by any chance? Yep. Yeah. Oh, good. Uh, could I talk to him? He's there. She's getting him. This is my boss, the guy who manages these buildings. Oh, I see. He's got the answer. He's got the answer to everything. He's a... Hello, Mr. Solent. Uh, this is Joe Swanagi, the Super 181 Sutton Place North. Yeah. Uh, look, Mr. Solent, we got a little problem over here. Oh, well, uh, w one of the tenants, 3A, Mr. and Mrs. Limwick, you remember I told you last time you were here that they separated, she walked out? Well, he's out of town, Mr. Sullivan, and she came up here this morning with a moving van and uh, four moving men there. Well, she wants to clean the place out. She wants to take the four men and go right in, so I said she can't do that. So she said, I'll call the cops. I said, go ahead, call the cops. And they're here right now. Yeah. Yes, sir, yeah, I, well, I was polite. I just didn't want to get in the middle. <laughs> or oh, was she who wanted to call the cops? I didn't want the cops around here. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, sir, he, he didn't ask me to change no locks or anything like that. No, he gave me no instructions to let her in or keep her out or nothing, so... Yeah. Yeah, well, what I want to know, Mr. Sonnen, is what am I supposed to do? Well, I mean, there's, there's five cops here, and there's four moving men, and her, and this big moving van. What, what am I supposed to... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I understand, yeah. All right. All right, Mr. Sullivan. All right, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Sullivan. All right, sir. Goodbye. Well? He said let her in. He said let her take whatever she wants. This is supposed to be a man's world. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. There were many people of your religion before the authorities decided to outlaw it. You all had the same faith, the same creed. You believed in the same things. One of the things you believed in was that man should worship God freely, in the way he desired, in the church of his choice. But that, in particular, was against the law. So your churches were taken away, your books were burned, and your ministers were sent to prison. Well, that's a picture of what could have happened to you in different times throughout history. It is happening today in certain countries, but you are protected against such things. Whatever your religion may be, the Constitution and the Bill of Rights say that you're entitled to follow it, to live according to its principles to follow its rituals and abide by its precepts. It's an absolute guarantee in 16 clear words. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. For 165 years, those words have endured. They will last as long as time itself. They're only a part of rights which belong to all the people. They're only a part of what we call our way of life. But they're a stirring example of how man has learned one lesson in his short time on Earth. That these things cannot exist for a few people. They must exist for all. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Kennelly. As I left the Sutton Place address, the moving men had started upstairs to the Linwick apartment. Sergeant Waters instructed his men to resume patrol, and I got back into sector car number five with patrolman Dillon. He continued to the East River Drive and 61st Street, where the salvage operations were underway. The sight of deep-sea divers and their gear had, in fact, attracted much attention. Traffic on the drive was slowed to a crawl, and the two patrolmen on the job had additional trouble keeping curious pedestrians from crossing the road. 
After observing conditions for a few minutes, I got back into the car and had Patrolman Dillon drive me to the nearest call box. There, I rang into the station house and spoke to Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer. I told him of the condition and gave him instructions for him to detail two more men to the job. I continued on patrol of the precinct until 11.30 when we drove downtown to the 15th precinct station house at 160 East 35th Street. There, I attended a meeting of all precinct commanders in the 6th Division, which was called by Inspector McBride in regard to a proposed new recruiting program for civil defense volunteers. The meeting ended a few minutes before 1, and I returned to my command, where in the muster room, Sergeant Tierney was on telephone switchboard duty, and Sergeant Waters was sitting in as desk officer. I walked around the desk to sign the blotter. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Tierney. Hello, Captain. Sergeant? All right, 42. Where's Lieutenant Gorman? He had to take his meal late, Captain. The mendicant squad picked up nine mooches on 3rd Avenue and dumped them in here. Oh? Lieutenant Gorman didn't get finished writing up the arrest until a quarter to one. Well, where are they? Back in the cells? No, sir. The patrol wagon came, and they were on their way down to court. Okay. Uh, anything doing around here? Oh, uh, that fellow over there came in about five minutes ago, Captain. He's waiting to see you. Yeah? I told him I didn't know when you'd be back. Well, who is he? He gave me one of his cards. Uh, yes, sir, here it is. Richard Linwick, Captain. Consulting engineer. The husband of the lady with the moving van, I guess. Oh, yeah. All right, I'll talk to him. I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant. Mr. Linwick? Yes. Oh, oh hello, Captain. You wanted to see me? Uh, yes, if you have a minute. I uh, understand you were over at my apartment this morning. That's right, I was. Uh, but you understand, there wasn't any law violation. There was nothing we could do. No, well, that's not what I wanted to talk to you about, Captain. Uh, I didn't expect you could do anything. Would you like to come to my office? Uh, Ladies, yes, thanks. Go ahead, Mr. Lindley. Yes, thank you. Ah, have a chair. Yes, uh, thanks. Well, what can I do for you, Mr. Lindley? Well, it's really not very much, Captain. Uh, you see, the super of the building finally got in touch with my office uh, right at 9 o'clock this morning. Yes? He told my secretary what had happened, and uh, she called me in Boston. I was in Boston on business. Uh, she reached me at my hotel, and I took the next plane back. I went right to the apartment from LaGuardia. The truck was already gone. Well, they can work pretty fast if they want to. <laughs> yes, so can Joanne. The only thing that she left was my clothes hanging in a closet. The clothes I had in the drawers... My shirts and things, she just took out and piled in a corner. And everything else was cleaned out. She didn't even leave a bed for me to sleep on. Well, as I told you, Mr. Linwick, there's nothing there that calls for police action. Well, I know that, sir. Excuse me. Yes, of course. 21st Precinct, Captain Connelly. This is Sergeant Waters, Captain. Yes? Uh, Captain, there's a two-alarm fire at 761 East 89th Street. All right, have a car come by for me. Yes, sir. Uh... Was what she took out yours or hers? Well, Captain, I paid for it. Uh, but I don't care. I mean, she can have it all if she wants it. Uh, there were some very nice things there. I had several thousand dollars in furnishings, but I don't care. The only thing I'm really angry about is a large Copenhagen bear that she took. I got it as a gift from a friend of mine after she left. And she took that with everything else. Uh -huh. Well, uh, what do you want? Well, I'd like to get that Copenhagen piece back. I... I called her office, but they say she's not in. I understand she gave you the address of a new apartment. No, she gave it to one of my men. Does he have it? Well, I'm sure it's in his memorandum book. Well, could he give it to me? Well, I don't see why not. You're her husband, aren't you? Yes, I'm her husband. We've, we've been married six years. You know how many times she's walked out in the six years? Nine, that I remember. When she did it, I always used to hope that she'd come back. I prayed that she'd come back. And I, I was very glad to see her. All my friends told me I was crazy. But this time she stayed away too long. I'm glad she's gone. The only thing I want back is that Copenhagen bear. She's not entitled to that. You're uh, not going to make any trouble if you get her new address. Oh, no, sir. No, no, no. All I want is that one thing that belongs to me. The, that's the one thing I care about. As far as the rest of the stuff is concerned, she can have it. She can sell it. She can keep it. She can do anything she wants with it. Now, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I don't know why I didn't let it happen years ago. Well, I guess you know what's best for you. Yes, sir, I, I think I do. When I got back to the apartment, I told the super to change the locks. 
After the horse is stolen, that's me. Change the locks after the horse is stolen. He did it right then. Why didn't you do it before? Well, I've been trying to figure that out, Captain. I, I guess I have. I, I think I wanted her to come back. Unconsciously, at least. My lawyer told me she might do exactly what she did. He advised me to change the lock, but, uh, well, I left it. I was hoping that she'd come back. I thought maybe I needed her. But I don't. I'm sure of it now. I don't want any part of it. I instructed the super that if she does show up and wants to get in the apartment now, not to let her in. I gave him explicit instructions. Yeah, well, I'll get the officer on the job over there and see if we can find her new address. Oh, fine. I'd certainly appreciate that, Captain. And I guarantee you I won't cause any trouble. All I want to do is go by there and see how I can get that piece of Copenhagen. It's a beautiful thing. You know, it stands about this high. Are you interested in Copenhagen? No, no. Uh -huh. Well, I used to have a collection of it, but, uh, well, she didn't like it, so I got rid of it. Had some very nice things. This friend of mine sent it to me from Denmark, you know. He was on a job over there. Excuse me. Oh, yes. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Waters, Captain. Yes? Two alarm fire just hit out, Captain. Oh? Yes, sir. Vaccaro rang him. He said it was an automobile on fire inside a filling station. The first fire officer on the scene turned in a second alarm because it was near all his gasoline and oil. But it's all right, it's out. All right, Sergeant. Cancel the car. I won't roll. Uh, just a second, Captain. Yeah? Yeah? Is that so? Uh, Captain? Yes? That superintendent from 181 Sutton Place North just rang in again, Sergeant Tierney tells me. Oh, well, what's the trouble there now? The sergeant said he asked for Mr. Linwick. I told him he's in your office. Is he still on the phone? Yes, sir. All right, put him through to here. Yes, sir. Tom, put that call through to the captain's office. Hold on, Captain. Right. Hello? 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Hello. Oh, hello, Captain. I just wanted to talk to Mr. Linwick. He told me he was going there. Yeah, he's right here. Well, I, I can tell you, his wife is here again. So is the movie fan. She wants to move all the stuff back in. Well, is she doing it? Well, he, he had me change the locks, and he gave me specific instructions not to let her in the place. Well, you want to talk to him? No, if you, if you just tell him to get right over here, she's giving me a hard time. All right, I'll tell him. Please, and, and tell him to run, not walk. All right, I will. Yeah, thank you. Ah, that was a message for you, Mr. Linwick. Oh, it was? Yeah, it was the super at your building. He says your wife is back at the apartment. So is the moving van. She wants to put everything back in again. Oh, does she? He wants you to come right over there and get it settled. Well, she's not going to. I'm not going to let her. Well, she's waiting there, Mr. Linwick. Don't you think you ought to go over and get it settled? Oh, it's settled. It's, it's settled now. Uh, but I, uh, well, I better go over and talk to her. That's the least I can do, talk to her. Mr. Linwick left my office in a dejected frame of mind. He said he was going right to his apartment and get the matter settled. I remained in my office, cleaned up some additional paperwork, and talked to a delegation of Second Avenue merchants who were complaining about vandals breaking their store windows during the night. I told them we had increased our patrol activities in that area in order to prevent the vandalism, and that Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, had his men investigating the case. I promised them that I would check with Lieutenant King to determine how far his investigation had progressed and whether any arrests could be expected shortly. At 2.25, a car came by the house for me, and once more I went out on patrol of the precinct. At 3.20, during the course of the patrol, we had occasion to turn into Sutton Place North. There, in front of 181, was parked the same huge moving van that had been on the scene in the morning. Standing on the sidewalk were the four movers, and several feet away from them, Mrs. Lenwick was talking to the superintendent of the building, Joe Swanagi. I instructed the operator to stop the car. All right, stay here, Dylan. Yes, sir. Well, it's about time somebody got here. Oh, did you expect me, Mrs. Lenwick? She expected her husband? I most certainly did. I understood that he left the police station two hours ago and was coming right over here. Where is he? Oh, I haven't any idea, Miss Linley. Well, he must have told you where he was going. He said he was coming here. Where did he want at the police station, anyway? He just wanted to know where he could find you. Oh, did he? He told me they said at your office that you were out and wouldn't be in for the rest of the day. He wanted to know if we had the address of your new apartment. Did you give it to him? It wasn't necessary. In the meantime, we found out that you were here. Yes, I've been here. I've been here for two hours. Two and a half hours, almost. And he won't let me upstairs. Well, it's a different story now than it was this morning, Mrs. Limerick. Well, An I don't see why it's... An entirely different story. 
We got instructions from Mr. Limerick not to let you in the apartment, and I changed the lock for him. Now, that situation's a little bit different than the situation was this morning. I uh, understand you want to move all the furniture and things back. Well, that's what I wanted to do, but after two hours, I'm not so sure. Now, if you moved them out this morning, why do you want to move them back this afternoon? Now, there's a question. Because I thought that I would give him another chance. Are you sure he wants it? Doesn't look like to me he wants it. He told me to keep her out, change the lock. That doesn't look to me like he wants it. I'm still his wife. Yes, that's true. And I demand the right to get into my apartment and put our furniture back. Mrs. Linwick, you were standing right there when I checked with the office again, and they told me in as much as Mr. Linwick gave me instructions not to let you in, and you had moved out already, and the lock had been changed, not to let you in. Now, what more could I do? Where could he be? Well, I haven't any idea. He knew I was here. Yes, he did. Maybe that's why he didn't show up. Joe, you've been making sly remarks all afternoon. Now, I wish you'd stop it. Yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I'm still paying those movers by the hour. Four men in a truck can mount up, you know. Well, Cap, here he comes. Well, it's about time. Uh, Mr. Swanagi, you better go back into your apartment till they need you. Oh, Captain, I, I stuck it out this long. Yeah, go ahead. All right. You say so, Captain. Look at him. He sees me standing here. He sees me. Keeps me waiting two hours, and he comes down the sidewalk as if nothing in the world concerned him. As if there was nothing happening around here at all. Mm-hmm. Richard. Richard, here I am. Oh, how do you like that? Richard. Yes, I see you, Joanne. Where have you been? Oh, hello, Captain. Mr. Linwing. Where have you been? I, I brought everything back. I'm willing to give you another chance. And, and, and you keep me waiting here for over two hours, two hours and a half almost. Well, I'm sorry about that, Joanne. Well, come on, give me the keys so we can get the furniture upstairs. No, I'm not going to do it. What do you mean, no, you're not going to do it? Just that, Joanne. I'm not. Richard, I'm willing to come back to you. Don't you love me, Richard? I always thought I did, Joanne. Now I only feel sorry for you. Sorry for me? That's right. I've been walking for two hours. I've been trying to figure out whether I should take you back just because I'm sorry for you. And I decided not to, Joanne. I see. Don't I have some say in the matter? You had your say. You walked out. I just can't take you back because I'm sorry for you, Joanne, so that's it. Captain, Captain, tell him he's got to let me in. He's got to. Th that's the law, isn't it? Well, I couldn't give you an opinion on the law, Miss Linwing. Well, he can't turn his wife out on the street. He can't just evict her from his mind. I don't know whether I can or not, Joanne, but I'm going to try. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Wait a minute, who is this? Where? What's the address? Yeah. And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, featured in tonight's cast were Joan Allison, Bill Zuckert, Harold Stone, and Les Damon. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.